Hi everyone, welcome to our intermediate calling for Android webinar at Wizen Academy. And thank you very much for being here today and for taking the time to participate. My name is Laura Perales. I'm the Academy Program Coordinator. For those who haven't heard about WiseLine or Wizen Academy before, let me do a very quick introduction. WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the United States, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain, with six years of experience and 700 employees worldwide. We started as a product company and gradually migrated to the services once we realized that we could help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, user experience, project management, SRE, QA, artificial intelligence, mobile, etc. WiseLine is a trusted ally of brands such as uh, National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. As part of our uh, learning and development culture, WiseLine motivates all its employees to learn by teaching, which means sharing uh, with the internal and the external community the knowledge and experience that we generate day by day, contributing to everyone's professional growth. We did this through Wizen Academy and its free educational programs such as workshops, talks, certifications about today's most high value skills in tech in each discipline we have, such as this uh, webinar prepared by one of our mobile engineering experts, Victor Lopez. Thanks, Vic, in advance for the dedication and for sharing your knowledge. Please follow us on academy.wisen.com or on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn as Wisen Academy and take advantage of everything we prepare for you. Last but not least, enjoy the course. Try to be focused, ask as much as you want about the topic and do some networking. This space was created for you. So thanks again, Vic, and the mic is all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Victor Lopez. I'm a senior Android developer here at WiseLine. I've been working here for three years and a half. Uh, well, I become a, a mobile developer when I discover my passion for technologies and also solving problems. And something that I can share with you is that in this path, I learned that uh, being updated uh, gives you uh, the advantages to like being more productive and keep growing uh, professionally. And well, today, uh, my good friend Alberto, who is a great developer too, is going to be helping us in the, in this, uh, sorry, in the comment section. He will be answering all the, all the questions you can have uh, while the webinar is running, okay? So welcome to this uh, intermediate Kotlin for Android course. And well, before to start, I'm going to share some rules that uh, all of us, we need to, to follow, okay? Okay, we have these important notes. So please identify yourself in Zoom using your name and the last name. Please mute your microphone along the course. Use the chat for, for questions during the uh, Q&A section. Focus uh, your question on the presented topic. Turn off your camera in case of connection issues. And recording is not allowed. Uh, for this last uh, topic, uh, don't worry, uh, the academy team will send an email with these uh, resources. And also we have the academic code of conduct. So please be respectful. There are no bad questions or ideas. Be welcoming and patient and be careful in the words that you choose. Okay? So let's start with the agenda. Well, for the agenda we have some uh, topics. The number one is a quick review for uh, Kotlin basics. The number two is function types and lambdas. Number three is extension functions. Number four is coroutine. And the last is the Q&A section, okay? So let's start with a quick review about Kotlin basics. Okay, in Kotlin basics, we are going to see what variables strongly type, null safety, classes, functions, interfaces, and control flow are, okay? So, as you know, in Kotlin, we have two types of variables. 
we have bar and we have val. In this example, you can see this variable called message, uh, which is a string. As you can see, the value is hello world. And the thing about a bar variable is that this kind of variable is a mutable variable. It means that we can change the value. As we can see in this example, we are setting, uh, setting up a different value as uh, passing a new string, okay? The next type of variable is a val variable. In this case, we only need to use the reserved word val, and there we set up this variable. The difference is that, it, that with this uh, variable, we cannot change the value. It's immutable. It's immutable. So if we try to set a new value, we will have a compilation error because a val variable cannot be changed, okay? Another topic is the strongly type. In Kotlin, we can specify the type of the, of the variable. In this case, as you can see, we have this example, this variable called message, which is a string. So if we want to specify the type, we only need to use after the name of the variable, the colon, and then the type. In this case, it's a string. But also, in Kotlin, uh, we, can, we have this uh, way to create a variable. In this case, we are not specifying the type. So this, the Kotlin uh, compiler is inferring that uh, this variable is an integer. But again, remember that a strongly type is as specifying the type. In this case, again, we are using the colon, and then we are declaring that this variable is an integer. And this is super useful because sometimes we can have or we can need these uh, variables as another type. In this case, we can change this type for a long and it is still being a, it is still being, is a one. So that is super useful in some cases, okay? The next thing is um, null safety. Uh, uh, null safety basically is a way that we can use, uh, uh, that we can use to avoid using the uh, null pointer extension. In this case, we can see this uh, variable is a message uh, con with a value hello world. In this case, we know that this is null safety because when we declare the type, we are not seeing a question mark. So this is a non-nullable variable. So what happened if we try to set null for this variable? Well, we will have an, a compilation error again because if this is a non-nullable. In this case, null cannot be a value of a non-null variable, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, the next, in the next example, we can see the same as, uh, variable, but in this case, when we are declaring as this, this variable is a string, we see the question mark. Uh, this question mark basically indicates to the Kotlin compiler that this variable can be null, null okay? So what happened if we try to set null for this variable? Well, basically, this is okay because this variable is nullable, okay? The next thing is classes. Well, in Kotlin, it's super easy, as you know, create a class. Basically, we only need to use the, the reserved word class and then name it. In this case, this class, uh, the name is my class. And also, we don't need to have a body for these classes in Kotlin. If we want to create an instance of a class, it's the same as a variable. Basically, we are declaring this variable called my class and then we need to create this new instance by only open the, the parentheses after the name of the class. Here we have another example of how can we create a class. Basically, if we need to pass some parameters to the class, we only need to declare those uh, parameters inside the parentheses. So in this case, we are passing a string and the name is type. Uh, in this case, this uh, variable is scope, it's only for this, the constructor scope. And if we want to have uh, available this variable for the scope of the whole class, we only need to declare if it's a variable that is bar or val. In this case, remember bar is uh, mutable and val is immutable. And the next uh, way that we can do the same is using private. So it means that uh, this variable is only available for the internal scope of this class. If other class is generated from this class, e, that class cannot use that variable. And as well, we have this uh, other way to declare a default value for these parameters. 
in this case, if you want to declare a default value, uh, after the declaration of the variable, we only need to use the equals and then pass the uh, default value. In this case, it's class type. And well, the next thing is functions. Uh, as other languages, if we want to declare a function, we need to use a reserved word. In the Kotlin uh, side, is we need to use fun. And after fun, we need to call the, the function. In this case, this function is called say hello world. We open the parentheses, and if we need some uh, parameters, we need to declare the, par the parameters in there. If not, it's empty, and then we open the braces, and inside of this scope, we are executing this print line that basically is printing this hello world. Another way to do the same, in Kotlin, we have these inline functions. Basically, we only need to remove the braces uh, using this equal sign and then uh, uh, add the code that we want to execute in this case. And we again are printing line uh, and we are printing the text, this text, hello world. Here we have another example of how can we create a function. In this case, it's the same, but in, inside of the parentheses, we are declaring a variable or a parameter. In this case, the parameter is a string called message. So when we call this function, we need to pass that uh, value, which is a string, and the function inside print line will print the string that we pass. Again, as we saw with the classes, we can declare uh, the file value. In this case, it's the same. We, need, we only need to add the uh, equal sign and then declare the default, the default value. In this case, it's hello world. So if we call this function, we, we, it's not necessary to pass a, a value. If we don't pass a value and only call say, this will print hello world. Otherwise, uh, we need to pass the value and this will print the value that we pass. Here we have another example, but in this example, we can see that we are returning something. So how can we return something? Basically, we only need to add the colon after the parentheses, and after that, we need to declare the type of the return. In this case, we are past, uh, we are returning an integer. So uh, the code, the result that will that will return is the sum uh, from b and, and a and plus b. Sorry. And interfaces uh, and an interface as other languages. In Kotlin, we only need to use the reserved word interface and name, and then name it. In this case, we name it this interface as drinkable. It's super easy and it's the same as a class. In this example, we can see that we have this interface and we have a class called coffee. In this case, we are implementing this interface, but as any of these classes and interface has a body, we don't need to have a body as well. If we want to add some uh, body, uh, for example, in this case, inside of the body of the interface, we added a function, the, this function is drink, right? So uh, the class that is implementing this interface needs to override the, the function that are declared in the interface. In this case, the drink function. And inside of the scope of this function, need, we need to do something. In this case, we are printing a uh, so tasty, okay? In Kotlin, the interface uh, uh, is super powerful because also we can implement or do the implementation inside of an interface. So in this case, we don't need to uh, wait to override the function. We can have an implementation inside of an interface. So as you can see, inside of the body of the function drink, we are printing so tasty. And as the uh, as the uh, class coffee is implementing this uh, interface. We can call the function drink and this will print so tasty. Another good thing about interfacing Kotlin is that we can have some variables. In this case, we have this uh, string uh, called type. So if we implementing this interface, we need to override the variable and we need to set up a variable. This is super useful because maybe we can force a user uh, to have a variable that we need and it can be super useful. Okay, the next thing is control flow. 
Well, in this example, as you can see, I generated two variables, A and B. And the control flow, we have some things like, for example, if, and the if is the same as other languages. We only need to, to use the reserved word if. Then we need to, uh, to have a condition. In this, case, in this case, we are checking if A is greater than B. And then if the condition is met, this, uh, this uh, condition will print a, a is greater than B. And to have the, the body, we need to open the races and put the, the code that we need to execute inside. Also, as other languages, we have the else. It's the same as other languages. If the condition is not met, the else, the code inside of the else will be executed. Another good thing about control flow is the for. So the for is the same as other languages. We need to use the reserved word for. Then we need to open the brackets. And the first thing that we need to declare inside the parentheses is the variable. In this case, the variable is character. Then we need to use the reserved word in. And then we need to pass the, the value that we, that we will iterate. In this case, is the string, is this string hello world. So instead of the block of the for, we will print every character of the word hello world. In this example, we have another uh, another for, but in this case, we can see that we are going to iterate in a range. So instead of using or passing a value, we need we are setting up a range. In this case, we are using the iteration from zero to ten. How can we do that? It's the same. We first we need to uh, to add the variable. In this case, is number using the reserved word in, and that and then passing the range. We need to first add the first uh, number, in this case is zero, using double point and then the finish value. So this will bring uh, from zero to 10, okay? And here we have another example. In this case, is the same as the first example that we saw, but in this case, we are printing an array. So this will bring first hello and then word. In control flow, in Kotlin, we have another things. In this case, this is a when. A when is similar to a switch, so a switch in other languages. But when has a lot another good things that I will show you. In this case, to use a, uh, to use a when, first we need to use the reserved word when, and inside the parentheses we need to pass a value that we will use to, to check the conditions. So inside the block, or the braces, we have some conditions. The first condition is zero. So if sugar cubes is equal to zero, uh, we will print the right way to drink coffee. If uh, sugar cubes is equal to one, we will print, it is a sim, but I can ignore. And if any condition is, is met, we will print the else. It's an unforgivable sim, okay? Another good thing about uh, a when in Kotlin is that we can uh, set more than one uh, condition in the same line. In this case, you can see that I have one and two for the same line. So if, the condi if this condition is met, I, I mean, if sugar is one or two, we will print, it's a sin, but I can ignore. And another thing that we can do is to have a range inside of a when. In this case, if you, we want to have a range, in a condition, we first we need to use the in reserved word and then uh, set up a range. In this case, we are using from three to, to five. So if sugar caves is three or five or four, uh, this will print, it's a kind, it, it is a kind of candy. And well, that is the way that uh, the wing works. And in control flow, we, we are still checking what is control flow. Here we have another, another thing, we have the while. The while is same as other languages. If we want to use these iterations, uh, first we need to use the reserved word while, and inside of the parentheses we need to put a condition. In this case, we are checking if sugar cubes is greater than zero. And as sugar cubes is greater than zero, uh, the, block, the code that is inside of the block will be executed. In this case, Every time that the code is executed, we will reduce the cubes uh, uh, one step at a time. 
So at the end, when the while is and the condition in the while is met, this will print line we because we finished the iterations. Here we have an example of a while, but in this case it's an other while. It's similar, but the difference is that first we need to declare the, the thing that we want to do. To do this, first we need to uh, use the reserved word do. We open braces and we uh, put some code that we want to execute every time uh, while the condition is not met. So then we add the while word and we put the condition in, inside of the parentheses. In this case, it's the same. While the sugar cubes is greater than zero, we will execute the code inside of do. And when the condition is met, uh, the, the iteration will finish and we will print zero again. Uh, well, basically that's, that was the quick review about uh, Kotlin. I know all of you know Kotlin, but I want to, to have this summary to, to check that we saw. So we, we saw variables, strongly typed, null safety, classes, functions, interfaces, and control flow. And I also added the links to the official documentation. And well, as you, as you can know, these uh, slides, we will share it again in the email that the Android uh, uh, team will share, okay? So you can check this uh, documentation later. And well, we just finished with the first topic that was Kotlin uh, basics. Okay, the next topic is fun function types and lambdas. So let's start with this topic. Okay, here we have a, a small text about function types. Okay, with Kotlin, we can use functions as a type value. That means that we can declare variables for not only primitive values and class instances. We can also declare variables with a function value. For that, we need to specify two things. First, is the function required parameters, and second, specify the return type, in case that have a return. Okay, so for to have more uh, context about this, I'm going to show you some examples of how can we create a function type for a variable, okay? So in this first slide about function types, you can see this uh, function is a normal function. In this function, we are passing two integers and we are returning again an integer. So it's a normal function. But how can we create a variable with a function type? So if we want to do that, first we need to declare the variable. In this case, I declare this val variable called function type variable. In this case, as you can see, we are not declaring any type of class or primitive value. We are declaring the, the parameters and the return that the function that we created before needs. So as you can see, after the colon, we open brackets and we are passing the two integers that the function needs. And then we are adding the arrow. And after the arrow, we added an integer that is the return. To initialize the variable, we can, use, we can do this. We only need to add the equals then use this double colon and then uh, use the function. With that, basically we are, we are telling the Kotlin compiler that this variable is equal to the function. Okay, so how can we use this? It's super easy. In this example, I declare another uh, variable, result, and we only need to call the, the variable and so, we are using equals and then we call function type variable. The weird thing here is that we are passing uh, parameters to a, a variable, right? But it is okay because remember that the type of this variable is equal to a function. So when you declare a variable as a function type, we need to pass the parameters that the function needs in case that the function needs parameters, okay? So here we have another example of how can you use uh, the function types. In this example, you can see that we have this class coffee. And in this class, we are using a function type as, as a interface, right? So the way to do this uh, basically is only adding this column after the name of the class. Again, we need to set up 
the, the, fun the parameters that the function needs. In this case, we have these two integers. Then we need again to pass the, the arrow and declare the type of the return. So when we use a function type in a class, we have uh, the advantage of, use, of, of using these invoke functions. Uh, and as you can see, this function is, require, is requiring uh, the two, two integers. Why two integers? Because we declare two integers in the constructor. If we only need one integer, uh, the function invoke will only require one integer. And in this case, as you can see, the function is returning an integer as well. So this will execute the, the, the sum of these two values, and this will return a result, right? So how can we use this? Well, basically, if we want to use this class that is implementing a function type as an as a interface, first, we need to create an uh, a instance of this class. In this case, I added this my class variable, which is an instance, instance of my class. And what if we want to use the function? Well, basically, we only need to uh, first uh, use the my class instance and then use the function invoke. We will pass these two values and this will return four, right? But there are also another way to use this. It's the same, but as this uh, class is using this function type, we don't need uh, forcing, we don't need to f uh, use the invoke way. We are, we only need, we can only pass these two parameters and that's it, it's the same. We can use invoke or don't use invoke, again it's the same. Okay, here we have another text about lambdas. Uh, lambdas is a simplified uh, representation of a function which has no name and is defined with a braces. Which, which takes variable as a, as a parameter, if any, and body of function, okay? So let's see some example to have a better understanding of this. Okay, here we have the same example of, a, of the function type we created before. As you remember, we created this function called function type variable that needs two parameters, two integers, and then this, uh, this variable is returning an integer, right? So in this case, instead of uh, initialize this uh, variable with a function, we are using a lambda. How can we do that? Well, basically, we need to add the equal sign, open braces, that is the body of the function, and basically to use the parameters that the function needs, we need to declare the functions before the arrow. How can we do that? Well, in this case, after the first, when we open the braces, uh, I am declaring value A and value B. In this case, we need to return an integer. So inside of the body, we are doing the operation A, value A plus B, B, value B, sorry. And this will return the result of this operation, right? So how can we do, how can we use this a new variable? Well, basically it's the same. Uh, we only need to use, for example, in this case, a new variable and we are calling this variable that is a, that has a function type. And, a, and again, we are passing two values, two and two, so this will return four. But remember, this is a variable with a function type. And here we have another example of a lambda. So in this case, if we want to use this lambda, we can pass this lambda as a parameter in a class. Remember, if we want to pass a parameters inside of the parentheses. So to create this lambda, first we need to declare the name, in this case is lambda. Then we need to add the colon. And inside of the parentheses, we need to declare the type of value that we want to, to, to return in the lambda. And the lambda basically is returning nothing. So after the arrow is, we need to add the unit, uh, the class, okay? So how, how this works? Basically, I added another, uh, another function inside of this class. I added this make coffee function. And inside of this, uh, of this uh, uh, function, I am calling the variable or the lambda function type variable. And when we call this variable, we are passing a value, okay? 
So I see that I'm creating this lambda, but how can I use this lambda? Okay, so let's check an example. As we created this class use, uh, using this lambda, we can have, uh, we can create this lambda in the constructor. How can we do this? Well, basically, we first we need to create a, an instance of this class, but instead of uh, add the parentheses after the name of the class, in this case, as we no, are not passing bar, uh, parameters, we only need to uh, add the, the braces. And as you can see inside of the braces, we see this it word. Basically, it is the result of the lambda. The lambda is returning, okay? Then we need to uh, add the arrow, and there we are executing, executing something. In this case, I'm printing the result of this lambda. Okay, so this lambda will only be executed when the make coffee function is executed. So how can we do that? Well, as you can see, we take the, the new instance, my class, and we call the, the function make coffee. So this will execute the, the function make coffee and the lambda will return the, the string so tasty, okay? Okay, here we have another example, but in this case, this is a function, this is not a class. So we can add a lambda in a function as a parameter. In this function, I am adding three parameters. The first two ones are uh, integers and the third one is a lambda. So as you can see, I am executing uh, the operation inside of the result the lambda. How can we do that? Well, basically inside of the, of the body, I need to, to call the lambda. In this case, is, is the callback. And inside of the parentheses, I'm doing the operation. Value A plus value B. So this will return uh, the, the result in the lambda. Here is an example of how it works. So in this case, we are calling the function sum. We are passing the two numbers that are required, two and two. And then we see that we have the lambda. And again, if we want to use the, the value of the lambda, we need to use the it, then put the arrow, and then we can use the value that the lambda is returning, okay? And well, that was uh, function types and lambdas. Again, this is a summary that we saw. And again, I added some uh, resources. You can see this documentation is official. And remember that this slide will be uh, shared uh, when the academy team uh, send the email, okay? So the next topic in the agenda is uh, extension functions, okay? So let's start. Okay, extension functions. Here we have another uh, small text. Kotlin provides the ability to extend a class with new functionality without having to inherit from the class. This is done via special declaration called extension. So what that means? Well, basically we can have a class, uh, for example, if we have a, a string and we want to have more functionality for this class string, we can have more functionality by using these extension functions. Let's see some examples. As you can see, we have again this uh, variable called message, which is a string. And the value is hello world. But as I mentioned, uh, I want to create a new functionality to this class string, right? So how can we do that uh, using extension functions? Well, that is super easy. We only need first to uh, create a new function, right? So to create a function, again, we use the reserved word fun. Then we declare the type that we want to extend. In this case, it's a an string. And then we need to name it this new function. In this case, it's print value. Uh, we add the parentheses and we add the braces. So in this case, we are not passing parameters, but we are using this to print uh, the value. So as you can see, we added a new functionality to this uh, string class. In this case, we will print the value as using this. How can we use that? Well, basically, as we have this uh, variable string, which is a message, 
for, sorry, this string message, which is a string, we can, now we can call this new method that we just created called print value. So when we use this new Kotlin ex extension function, when we call this uh, function, this will print the value of this variable, in this case, hello world. And here we have another example that, that of something that we uh, use a lot in the application. I, I think all of you are sometime created a, a date based on a string. So as you can see, we have here this string called string date with a date, with a data, right? So if we want to parse this string, we can create a new extension function. How can we do that? Well, basically, again, we are creating a new function based on the string. But in this case, this function is called to date. And, and in this case, the function is returning a date. So inside of the body of this function, we are using this simple date format and we are passing a format that we want to parse. So in the next line, we are returning the, the parsing string. And as you can see, this is super useful because now we can parse strings only by calling this method. So as you can see, here we are creating this new variable called date, which is a date. And we only need to, to call the string date that we have. And then we only need to uh, call the new function extension that we created called to date. And this will return a new date based on the string. Okay, here we have another example. But in this example, I have a combination of two things that we are uh, looking. Uh, in this case, uh, we have this new function that is extending a bitmap. In this case, we created this new function, apply blur, right? Uh, so we are creating a new extension function, but also, as you can see, we are using this uh, lambda that is a parameter inside to this function, okay? So in this case, inside of the of the body of this function as you can see we have this long calculation that basically is the the application of the floor to this uh, bitmap right so this is super useful because maybe in this case we are playing a blur but maybe you need to create another uh, thing that needs to be or needs to be super calculated for some reason or maybe you need to do a network call, I don't know. And you can create this function with a lambda, and then we only need to return the value with the inside of the parentheses in the lambda. Here we have, how can we use this lambda? For this example, remember, I am applying a blur. So we are using this new extension function called apply blur, but instead of uh, get a normal return, we are getting the final result using this lambda. So after the braces, we have the value using the it, and then we will set the bitmap uh, for this image view. Okay, but uh, all, another thing that I want to share with you is that Kotlin by default has a lot of Kotlin extensions. It is the same, and we can use this by default by only us using Kotlin. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples of this. And well, for this, uh, we have this variable called message. And as you can see, in this case, this variable can be nullable, okay? So how, what is an example of this Kotlin extension? Well, here I am using a Kotlin extension called let. And in this example, you can see that I am using this uh, variable called message. Then I am adding the question mark because I don't know if the variable has a value or not, right? With this, we are validating if the, if the value is not null. Then we are using this lambda let, and this is super helpful because now using this lambda, we will uh, have a value if the variable is not null. And then if the variable message is not null, this will print the value, in this case, hello world. Here we have another example of another uh, Kotlin extensions. Uh, in this case, uh, we have this alert dialog. And as you know, 
uh, when we add or when we create a new alert dialog, we need to concatenate these, these functions to create it. For example, alert dialog, uh, that set message, message, that set title, that show. And this uh, finish in a really long line, right? So by using a, this apply Kotlin extension, we can have this new way to, to write code. So when we use this uh, Kotlin extension called apply inside of the body, we can use the methods that belong to the alert dialog and it's similar as if we are inside of the class. As you can see in the inside of the body, we are calling set message directly and we are passing a value. Again, we are using set title, we are passing a, a new value and then at the end we are uh, using show. And it is super useful and is super readable. Here we have another example of the same but in this case, we are passing a value as a parameter. In this case, we're using this Kotlin extension called width. Uh, when we use width, we, can, we need to pass a parameter and then we will have the scope of as the alert dialog is, uh, we are inside of the alert dialog. Again, we can call the method directly. In this case, we are using set message, set title, and at the end, we are calling show. And that you can see is similar at if we are inside of the class alert dialog. Well, here we, we are creating this uh, list to show you another example. In this example, as you can see, we have this list of numbers. As you can see, uh, we have this list uh, that is one, two, three, four, and five. And here we have uh, here here we are using another Kotlin extension. This Kotlin extension is named for each. This is another of the most uh, used uh, Kotlin extensions because it's basically a for, but in a Lambda way. So in this case, if you want to use this Kotlin extension, we only need to call the variable, in this case is list. Then we call the new the function, uh, the Kotlin extension called for each. And in the Lambda, we will have the iteration of this list. So the first iteration is one, the second two, and to the end. Right, so this will print every value of this array, and we don't need to create an for a for each. Okay, I'm going to show you another example of a usage of these Kotlin extensions. In this case, uh, I create this uh, class, this data class called Coffee, and this class, as you can see, uh, needs two parameters. So, I created a list of of this kind of uh, class and I created two uh, classes coffee inside of the list. So this is super useful because uh, sometimes this, uh, we need to call the first item of a list, right? So Kotlin give us this new Kotlin extension called first or null that basically is giving uh, or is returning the first item of a list in case that, in case that exists. If not, we'll return null. And as you can see, I am declaring this new variable called coffee, which is a coffee that can be nullable, right? After that, we use the equal sign and we call this a first or null class. So with that, we have a, a variable that will that is used and here I have another uh, good thing. And the good thing is that if we use this uh, extension function, we are avoiding a uh, null pointer exception because sometimes when we call the first item of a list, that item uh, doesn't exist and the application crashes, right? So with this way, we, we avoid that crash and we only need to validate the, if the, the variable exists or not. Okay, here I, here I have another example. Uh, this, in this example, we can see that I am using another another Kotlin extension. This new extension is, is called group by. This is a really good uh, extension because we with this extension, we can create a map. How can we do that? Well, basically calling this function and inside of the bracket is a kind of condition. So as you can see, again, we have the it that basically is, is the value that will be checked or 
that we need to, to iterate to check to create the map, right? So in this case, we are checking for the rating. So this will create a map in base of rating. So as you can as you can notice, there are three three classes coffee. One of the class, the rating is five, and two of the classes, the rating is four. So this will create a map, and the the first node has a has as a key the number five, and this will have a, as a value only one item, and this and this will create another a node that will create a key four, and this will add a list with these two values, American and other, and it's super useful to create basically a map. Okay. So yeah, that's it about uh, extension functions. I know uh, maybe I am uh, running, but it's a lot of information in this short time. Uh, well, I only want to let you know that there's a lot of extension functions. I, I just realized that I miss a slide here. I, I have the slide, but I miss, and I forgot to add it. Basically, I add more resources when you can see a lot of function extensions and and that's it so <laughs> keeping uh, so let's check the next uh, topic the next topic in the agenda is coroutines right so let's start so coroutines again here we have another uh, text a coroutine is a concurrency design pattern that you can use on Android to simplify code that executes asynchronously. Okay, uh, I know this sounds a little bit uh, uh, like hard, but I have some examples to show you how we can implement this code. And it's not as hard as it seems. Okay, so let's start. Okay, first I want to share you an example of, of this uh, synchronous request. And how can we use these coroutines uh, using the uh, sequential uh, way to write code, okay? So as you can see in this example, we are using this asynchronous request that is requesting a name, right? So instead of, instead of this function, we have this, uh, this variable called name and we are using this function request name. And as, as I mentioned, this method is a synchronous request. The problem by doing this is that when we use the asynchronous request, we are blocking the UI, the UI thread. And that is not a good practice because it's a really, really super uh, bad user experience because the user is not able to use the cell phone while this request is executing, okay? So the good thing about this is that this way is super readable, right? Because it's sequentially, okay? So let's check another example. In this example, we see this asynchronous request. The function is the same, print name, but uh, in this case, as you can see, the request name has a lambda or callback. So it means that when the, the function finish, we will have the value using this name parameter, this name uh, variable. So this will print the name when the, the, the request is finished. And this is, an, this is good in part because we are not blocking the, the, the main thread. It means that the user can use the, the application as usual. The UI, the UI is not blocked and it's super good, but there are another problem with this. Uh, the problem he, or the problems can have that we can have are that maybe we need to nest a lot of, of callbacks, right? As you can see in this example, uh, we need to have some values. The values that we need are the name, we, ne we need the comments, and finally we need the forums. And as you can see, if we want to do this, uh, we need to uh, nest a lot of uh, callbacks. In this case, first we need to request the name, and when the callback responds with a with a value, we use the name, and we use and we, we pass the name to another uh, asynchronous uh, function that is 
sponsoring with the comments, but as we want to have the forums as well, we need to nest another uh, function inside. So as you can see, this, this code is, is super messy and it's not readable. And for this example, I am using three nested uh, requests, but there are some cases when we can have 10 or, or more requests. So imagine the, how hard it is to maintain these uh, callbacks, right? So this is the coroutines way. As you can see in this example, we are, we have this, again, we have this same function called print name, but there's a, there's a small difference. In this function, we are adding this new word or modifier called suspend. So with that, we are letting know the Kotlin compiler that this is a suspended function, okay? So as you can see, this, this code is super readable and, and we are not using this uh, callback pattern, right? So this is the same, and the good thing is that it's in a sequential way. So in this case, we have this request name, which is an asynchronous task, but we don't have the callback, as I mentioned. So, but how can we create more uh, function, uh, suspended functions? Well, it's super easy if we want to create a new one, basically. Uh, we need to add this function inside of the scope as suspend coroutine. Okay, so let's just, let's uh, check uh, from the start. So here we have this function called request name, which is uh, returning a string, right? So first we need to use uh, use this, this word suspend and declare the type. It's a string, and instead of the body of this uh, function, we are using a return. We need to return a string, but as you can see, we are using this new uh, Kotlin uh, extension called suspend coroutine. And with that, we can uh, use uh, asynchronous tasks as usual. As you can see inside of the scope of this suspend coroutine, we have this class called get name request. Inside, and we are using this uh, interface to have the, the result, right? So. When we use this suspend coroutine, basically we are letting know the compiler that we need to suspend a thread, the thread that we are using. And we need to let know the system when, the, when we need to, con, to continue with the execution, right? To do that, when the incomplete is, is executed, we need to call the continuation and when use the result method and, we'll, and, then, we'll, and then pass the name. Right, so with that we converted a normal uh, function that returns something in an asynchronous way to a suspended coroutine. Here we have another example, but in this case uh, we are returning the list of the comments that we needed before, right? But the the way that I constructed this function is the same. We need to add the suspend coroutine. We are uh, doing the request and we are using the resume to return the, the value. So now that we created this new function, these suspended functions, we can see that the code that we have in the print name is super readable and we don't have these nested uh, functions, right? This is the same, but the, we are, as, as I mentioned, we are using these suspended functions. So as you can see, uh, we are, uh, adding this uh, code inside of a suspended function. And we can add these uh, functions if are suspended inside of a suspended functions. As you remember, request name now is a suspended function. function. And request comment is, is as well a suspended function. So we can first uh, request the name that is uh, executing in a synchronous way, but this, it lives in a in a suspended function, and then we request the comments, and then we only need to set the values. And as you can see, this code is super readable because it's, it's in a sequential way, right? And it it's looked, it uh, looks good. Okay, another good thing about suspended functions is that we can use this uh, 
threads, basically we can set the thread that we want to use. In this case, instead of this suspended function called print name, we see this uh, new function called with context. So when we use this uh, function, we need to pass a, a parameter. And this parameter basically is the thread that we want to use. In this case, as you can see, we, we are passing dispatcher IO. And then we are executing the, the code. But what uh, means this uh, dispatcher IO? Well, basically, uh, Coroutines has uh, three types of dispatchers. The first one is IO. Basically, this uh, dispatcher is used when we need to do a network and this operation. Uh, so, for example, if we need to request a name from a server, uh, we need to use this dispatcher. Okay? But there are other tools. Uh, the second is the foul. Uh, the the file uh, dispatcher basically is used to to do some intensive tasks. For example, if we want to do the apply blur as we saw before, we need to use the CPU because maybe it's super hard for the CPU. And the third one is main. Basically, the main is the the UI thread, or the because it's not blocking the code. So this is recommended to you to do some UI thread. For example, maybe we need to do some uh, animation or something. Uh, we can do. We can use this uh, this dispatcher. Okay. So as we saw before, uh, using a coroutine basically is coding sequentially using a synchronous task. Right? It it sounds weird, but yeah, basically as you as you can see in this example uh, that we created before inside of the suspended function called print name we are we are using a synchronous task but we see this coding a uh, sequentially way right and this is super readable so there are another uh, i think this sounds good but how can we use this suspended function well it's simple but First, I need to explain how to use these suspended functions because if we try to use a suspended function in a normal function, the compiler the compiler will, uh, will show an error uh, because a suspended function needs to live inside of a coroutine, okay? So as a, as a type of uh, mention, a suspended function is not a coroutine. The suspended function is a way to work with coroutines, but the suspended functions needs to be executed inside of, of a coroutine, okay? So if we try, again, if we try to call this function inside of a, a JSON click, we will have a compilation error, okay? So how can we use this coroutine? Well, if we want to use a coroutine, first we need to set up an scope. In this case, as you remember, we have the spring name uh, suspended function, right? So to set up a uh, scope, basically in the class, instead of the class, we need to, def to define this scope. In this, in this case, as you can see, we only need to use the coroutine scope, which is to set up uh, a an scope. And inside of this scope, we need to pass this parameter. Uh, basically, we are, uh, we are telling the, the, C the Kotlin compiler that we need to work with the main dispatcher okay so when now we, we can use the suspended function but to use the the coroutine first we need to to call the scope and then we need to launch the scope for that we only need to use this word launch after the scope and as you can see this is a lambda so inside of the of the body of this lambda now we can uh, use the, the suspended function, okay? And that's the way to, to use a scope, basically. Another good thing about the scopes or coroutines is that if we have this uh, scope, maybe for some reason, we need to cancel the, the um, how can I say? We can cancel the, the execution, right? So, if we want to do that, basically, basically we need to call the cancel method that belongs to the, the coroutine scope. 
In this case, uh, we can see that we have this onClear method. Uh, that means that the, the class in, with, in, that leaves this uh, coroutine will, will cancel this scope by only using scope that cancel, okay? And well, here we have another example, but maybe, because maybe you are asking how can I catch the exceptions, right? I explained before how can I uh, return a result using a, a suspended function, but also sometimes we need to have exceptions, right? So if we, if we want to have an exception or handle an exception, we can do this. For example, uh, here we have again the same function that created to to convert a, a normal way to use an asynchronous task converted to a suspended function. In this case, the the listener is has two functions: the incomplete and the on error. So if we want to handle an error, basically we need to use the continuation and then call the function resume with exception, okay? So when we have that, we can, we can use now the try catch. So inside of this on click, and we are using the scope, the core routine, we, by using the launch, and we are adding this try catch. So in the try, inside of the scope of the try, we need to, to add the code that we want to execute. But if the core routine or the new function, the suspended function is uh, returning an exception, we will have this exception inside of this catch. And well, that's the way to, basically that is the way to have the exception. And well, basically that is the, that is the way to use uh, core routines. I know is it can be hard at the start, and actually there are more other features that you can use, but at least this is a start and you can start coding with coroutines. And here we here I have a bonus. Um, I want to let you know that we can combine these coroutines with components, with architecture components. Uh, with coroutines, we also can take the advantage of the usage of the lifecycle aware coroutine scopes. So what it means? Well, basically, as I mentioned before, uh, we can cancel the scope, right? By calling a method or something. But for example, in this, uh, in this class called my view model, which is a view model, we, get, we can use the advantage of the view model scope. And then as you can see, we are uh, using the launch scope to launch the coroutine, right? So this is super good because in this case, uh, the view model is in charge of the life cycle of the core routine. What it means? Well, basically if, uh, if we are using this view model and we launch a core routine, if the user cancel the, the, the task or for example, close a, close a, a screen or something, the view model is in charge to cancel the core routines. Actually, we can have more nested uh, scopes and every scope will be canceled. And with that, we have the same, as you can see, we are printing the request name that lives in that of this coroutine. The scope, as, as I mentioned, is the scope that is handled for the view model, okay? And well, here we have another example, but in this case, I am using the scope of a fragment. The way to use it is the same. Um, in this case, as you can see, instead of the on view created, we are using uh, the scope. And to do that in the fragment, we first, we need to use the view lifecycle owner and then call lifecycle scope and then launch the coroutine. In this case, we are printing again the coroutine and again, all the methods that you need to add inside of this scope are in the sequential way. And well, basically that's it about coroutines. And yes, here I have a summary that we saw. As, I, as, as you remember, we saw how can we start with coroutines. And uh, also I added the architecture. I added the links. 
and with lead, with it, with these links you can check later to see more documentation okay so yeah the last uh, the last section is the q a so i hope uh, and thank you to alberto to helping us to to answer the question that you may uh, ask but if there are more questions in the air this time to answer so i wonder if there are some questions that i need to answer if you alberto can share those questions please in case that exists, right? <laughs> well, I don't see questions, so let me double check. And well, uh, I want to say thank you to all the people that uh, joined today. Um, but before to to Dick, to, there is a question on the chat. Okay, I don't see the questions. Uh, sorry, I can let me check. I can send it through Slack. Yes, please, because for some reason I don't uh, seeing the questions. Don't worry. Okay, uh, the question is: Is the dispatcher with view model scope necessary? For example, view model scope that launch I O. Oh, the question is if we need to declare a dispatcher inside of a view model, right? Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking the question. No, the, we don't need to declare the, the dispatcher. Basically, uh, the dispatcher is the, I, uh, is the IO, basically. So we don't need to declare a specify, to specify a, a specific uh, dispatcher. By default, is the I/O. And remember, the view model is in charge of the handle of the life cycle. Do we have another uh, question? I don't think. Uh, yeah, I see another question. The question is: What happens when we use, uh, for example, room or retrofit, which already supports suspended function? Well, that is a super good question. And basically, if we want to use room, uh, we have the ability to only adding the suspend uh, modifier before to the phone reserved word, and that's it. If we if we want to use room, we only need to to add the suspend function, but uh, we need to add a dependency. With that dependency, basically, is a kind of plugin to connect room. To the to the coroutines, and also there are other uh, there are other connectors. For example, if you used to if you use for example uh, retrofit, the, we can use retrofit uh, with these uh, plugins. Again, if we create a, for example, if we create an interface with the methods uh, that belong to the retrofit. Uh, Class, for example, we only need to use the suspend modifier before the fun word, and with that we will uh, use the, these functions as a suspended functions. Yeah. There's another question, I think. Uh, the question is, do you have a GitHub repo where we can see any coroutine demo? Uh, we don't, well, at least right now we don't have uh, this repository, but this uh, pres this presentation will be shared with you in a, in an email that we that will send the academy team. Uh, so, is there another question? Uh, I think there are no more questions, right? Yeah, I see another. Ah, no. It's an answer from Albert. So I think we finished. I don't see more, more questions. So I give you a minute more. If no, if there are no more questions, well, we will finish this uh, webinar, right? 
Uh, but first, uh, Alberto, did you answer all the questions, right? Yes, I did. Oh, thank you, Alberto. So I think there are no more questions. So again, uh, thank you for joining to the Thank you for joining to this uh, webinar. I hope it, it, this webinar is super helpful for you. And, but please, before uh, we conclude this webinar, I want to ask you if, if you can uh, complete this survey because this survey, it will help us to keep sharing this kind of content. So please take some time to answer, uh, to answer it. And again, thank you for joining today. My name is Victor, uh, and well, uh, have a good day.